you read me, Hal? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. This is Criteria. So today we're talking about 2001 A Space Odyssey. Hey James, how's it going? <laughs> it's going well, Thomas. How are you? You're still in New York, but I'm in Virginia right now, Northern Virginia. Yes. Why are we telling each other where just filling in, doing? just filling in the the listeners on <laughs> well, what's going I, on in our lives. Well, but you tricked me so that I was about to say yes. You went to Virginia because you wanted to have your child baptized, and I was like, wait, why am I saying this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm down here. My son, my newborn son. I guess he's he's a little over a month old now, but he was just recently baptized. Thanks be to God. And we came down here to Northern Virginia, where my family is. My father's a deacon, and he was able to baptize his grandson and a good friend of mine. Yeah, that's right. On the feast of St. Brendan. So now we'll just never forget the day that Brendan was baptized, which is a great blessing, you know, especially, you know, at this time during the coronavirus pandemic, where pretty much nothing is working out the way people hope it will Mm -hmm. to have my son's baptism, you know, really go off without a hitch was just a really great blessing. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, but I'm sorry that you're left in New York City by your lonesome. (laughs) Not that we were able to visit each other anyway. (laughs) Yeah, really. It makes no difference except for psychologically, except Mm -hmm. not even that, really. Have you watched any good movies lately, James, other than the one we're going to discuss today? Let's see. I did watch a movie recently. I don't know that I'd call it good. I didn't really like it. I'm a big fan of Mel Gibson and in particular of any movie where Mel Gibson picks up a gun. So, (laughs) you know, there's just, especially lately, he's been doing some really great work in the action department. So there's a great flick called Get the Gringo, which despite the sort of ludicrousy of its title is totally worth watching. I watched it a couple of years ago, so I can't really speak to, you know, the particulars of its suitability. It's definitely rated R. It's totally violent. And it's Mel Gibson, you know, kicking butt, but like righteously. And there's another one called Bloodfather in much the same vein. And both of these films, if I'm remembering correctly, have things to do with redemption and, you know, being a man. So I wanted to watch this other recent Mel Gibson action flick that I hadn't seen. I think it came out a year or two ago called Dragged Across Concrete. Now, if you know nothing about the film except for its title, that should tell you something. It was very violent and kind of just unsettlingly so. You know, I'm also a fan of Mel Gibson's directorial work for a lot of different reasons, but one of them being that I find that he handles violence in a very singular and I'd say beautiful way. The films I'm thinking of are Braveheart, for instance, or Apocalypto, and then certainly The Passion, a very violent film and yet profoundly beautiful in all of its, in the sort of the ugliness of of the violence that it depicts. You know, I think that The Passion perhaps could have only been directed by Mel Gibson, who has the kind of relationship to on-screen violence that he does as a director. You see this in his most recent directorial effort in Hacksaw Ridge. But this movie was not directed by him and probably shouldn't have even had him acting in it. I felt like Mel made a bad choice there. So I'm just not going to say much more about the movie except, you know, it's not worth seeing in my opinion. And Bloodfather and Get the Gringo are much better uses of your time if you're looking for Mel Gibson kicking butt. What about you? Do you see any good movies lately? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I wasn't thinking about the fact that we were going to be watching 2001, but I ended up rewatching The Matrix. And the reason I watched that was that I had watched a movie by Edgar Wright, Shaun of the Dead. 
And, you know, any of the movies I'm about to mention, you know, nobody should assume that they can watch them with their children, but just do your own <laughs> research, I suppose, so that I don't have to like make disclaimer after disclaimer. But yeah, and the reason I rewatched The Matrix after Shaun of the Dead is because I was looking for something else that had this kind of like real stylistic panache to it and mm -hmm. like editing style. I mean, I wouldn't say that The Matrix has the same editing style as Shaun of the Dead, but it definitely has this really snappy stylistic panache to it. So right. I rewatched the The Matrix movies and the first one definitely holds up, even though I don't think it makes very much sense. And then that got me thinking about the 1995 anime film Ghost in the Shell, which was a big influence on The Matrix. And that also deals with artificial intelligence to a certain degree, as well as other issues of kind of cybernetics and transhumanism. I'll be honest, I find the whole topic of artificial intelligence like holds no interest for me. Like I can enjoy a character that's an AI and I just like forget that it's supposed to be a computer. Agent Smith in The Matrix is a great character. Hal in 2001, which we'll be discussing today, is a great character. But but I don't find it philosophically interesting that they're computers. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, I tend to agree with you. I think that especially in more recent films dealing with the theme of artificial intelligence, they're just so like philosophically scattershot that – they're utterly uncompelling. Like a lot of the problems that are identified are just problems that like don't keep me up at night, you know, about sort of like emergent right. consciousness and ridiculous right. stuff like this. But I think that 2001 handles those questions a lot more compellingly than most. And I'll be interested mm -hmm. to hear what you think about that, Thomas. But, sure. you know, yeah, I, well, I think that this this film was probably for me my first encounter with those kinds of questions of AI, as it probably was for a lot of, of movie watchers, you know, when it originally came out in 1968 and since. But I think it still, it remains kind of one of the most haunting. It's cool that, that you watch Matrix and Ghost in the Shell because, yeah, that's, right. like, you know, very resonant with things going on in this film. Yeah, it wasn't planned, and it's. I was just following a thread, and it's funny that that thread began with Shaun of the Dead, which is <laughs> has this. You know, Edgar Wright's movies have this fast paced editing, and it's funny that that's that thread accidentally led to two thousand one. You know, right. in that respect, total which is opposite, the complete of fast opposite, pace right? Editing. Yeah. So I, I went with Ghost in the Shell, and Ghost in the Shell deals with stuff about AI, which I don't find interesting, but it also has other futuristic themes, which I do find interesting that it deals with more substantially, I think, than The Matrix does, such as the problem of how do you retain your identity if you replace your body almost yeah. entirely with cybernetics? Yeah. That's Like that's whether cool. the soul so could somehow be transferred into like a mostly robotic body or, totally. or remain in it rather. So that stuff is super compelling. And then that got me to finally watch this other classic, and that is Akira from 1988. That doesn't deal with AI. It deals with telekinesis. And although it, that one does deal with human evolution as mm. well, like 2001 does, but more as a result of like nuclear war and stuff like that. But I wouldn't say that I found it very thematically compelling, but it is beautifully animated and very aesthetically interesting. But anyway, so yeah, that's, that's kind of, I didn't even think about this until just now that that I had been watching all these movies dealing with the same themes of mm. 2001. But yeah, so let's let's get on to that. So 2001 A Space Odyssey from 1968, directed by Stanley Kubrick. Obviously, a hugely impactful film, you know, well beyond the domain of science fiction in every respect, you know, stylistically, thematically, in terms of technology and special effects, in terms of, you know, its use of music. And it's undeniably a masterpiece and also very dumb. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay, you're coming right out of the gates. So what did you think about 2001? Well, okay, so this wasn't the first time I've seen this film. It is a bit of a personal favorite of mine. It was the very first Blu-ray that I ever purchased back in, I don't know, like 2007 or something. I, I forget when Blu-rays really started to come onto the scene, but I remember thinking, oh man, 2001 A Space Odyssey in Blu-ray? 
like, that's a Blu-ray I got to own, you know? <laughs> so I, I guess, you know, I, I have some sort of affection for it because of that. But also because it's a movie that I remember from, you know, if not my childhood, at least my sort of young adolescence. My father, I kind of credit my father with being my first introduction into the world of, uh, let's call it, you know, more demanding cinema. He was a big fan of Akira Kurosawa, for instance. So he had all these samurai black and white films, you know, that I would see him watching as a child and, and sort of be just dumbfounded that he could watch a film in another language other than English and find it even remotely interesting. But then he also, I remember, had 2001 A Space Odyssey and Solaris. And Solaris is a film by Tarkovsky that, for our listeners who are not familiar, is you know similar to 2001 Space Odyssey in some respects in that it's a science fiction film, but it's also very slow paced. Right. So I remember watching Solaris as a child or attempting to rather, and just being just out of my mind bored. I couldn't even believe it. And, <laughs> you know, I thought to myself, what does my father see in this? And I kind of credit that with being the sort of the first, like sort of instructional moment, just knowing that there was something here that I wasn't seeing and that my father was. And so, you know, that's sort of, I guess, the beginning for me of, of beginning to look at film with a sharper eye. That's really cool. Yeah. So with 2001 A Space Odyssey, I was able to watch that film and make it all the way through, as opposed to Solaris, okay. where I couldn't. But with, with 2001, I could, and I was very proud of this. And frankly, I still am. And I find it riveting. <laughs> I enjoy it every time I've watched it. I've seen it a number of times. So, you know, maybe it's dumb. I don't know. We can talk about that some more. But I find <laughs> it thoroughly enjoyable. But Sure, of course. Yeah. Me too. Except for the last half hour or so. <laughs> yeah. So 2001, I think we'll probably, you know, talk as much about the style and formal qualities of this film as about the the plot, you know, mm -hmm. such as it is. Here's a question for you. Well, it's a preliminary to another question. Okay. Why at the beginning of the film do they have three minutes of a black screen with just music? Yeah. You know, when I first booted up the Blu-ray, I thought that there was a, something like wrong. I thought mm -hmm. that the disc wasn't working and Same. I panicked for a Same. moment. Yeah. Yeah, well, so I don't know. I mean, I would venture to guess that Kubrick is interested in having that opening couple minutes of darkness and music function, you know, as an overture. Right. But you don't hear any musical themes that are repeated later on in the film. But maybe you're sort of nonetheless initiated into the kind of like liminal space that Kubrick wants you to occupy watching this movie because it's true right. that watching this film demands a very particular kind of orientation of the viewer an orientation more akin to considering a painting in a gallery mm -hmm. rather than you know sitting by the campsite listening to a story told 2001 tells a story and the story is very important to what Kubrick is doing here but it's not just a story that I don't think that the choices that Kubrick is making with the film are only with reference to the narrative. You know, we're kind of conditioned to viewing movies as a vehicle for delivering story. And it's true that 2001 does that, but it does other things as well. And you are not able to really appreciate those other things or have these other choices that Kubrick makes, have them work on you. Unless you're kind of disposed to receive them. And right, my speculation right. is that that initial overture is more about disposing you as an audience member to sort of receive, you know, let's call it a more contemplative kind of experience that he sets up in a lot of these really long duration sequences. Do you think that it could also have any sort of thematic or plot significance, though? Like, could it represent the void or <laughs> yeah. know, before the creation of the world or something? Totally. So my real question, though, is why does he have it a second time after the intermission? That was what puzzled me. Mm -hmm. He repeats that. 
with I don't know if it's exactly the same music, but it's clearly like the same from the same piece right. or very right. similar. Well, you know, there's a lot of what seems to me to be book ending that goes on in this film. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, in the first act, the dawn of man, we have these shots of vast expanse and barren wastes, these landscapes that are just right. empty. And that it's a montage of, of shots like that, that kind of is repeated, you know, obviously with a variation at the end during this trippy sequence when, you know, yeah. Bowman is sort of seeing these alien landscapes that are also like just kind of uglier. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But, you know, there's that there's little sort of internal rhymes that occur with like Dr. Floyd calling his child on her birthday from the space station. But then Dr. Frank getting a phone call from his parents on his birthday. And obviously a lot of visual repetitions, you know, the opening shot of the planets in alignment is kind of one of the most obvious sort of visual motifs that recurs. But anyway, you know, I'm, I'm kind of just pulling out these examples to sort of illustrate that Kubrick, I think is playing with repetition and, you know, we'll call it rhyming throughout the film. And so I don't know exactly why he's doing it here, but I think that it's a nod to this sort of book end quality, this duality that is happening at the beginning and at the latter half of this film. So, okay, here's another question because you mentioned Solaris and the director of Solaris, Andre Tarkovsky, by the way, I hope we can discuss Solaris on this show one day. Yeah, I'd love that. And we will be discussing two of his other films, at least, because two of them are on the Vatican film list. But he did not like 2001. And he made comments to the effect that he felt that its portrayal of the future and of space travel was like a comic book. And that, you know, for the people in the story, it would be like taking a bus, you know. And that basically that Kubrick kind of romanticizes it in this way. But I don't know that I actually, now that I've seen the film, I don't know that I actually agree with this because it's true that especially in the first maybe half hour of the space sequences, we do get some kind of like kind of 1950s portrayals of the future where we're like wondering at this, you know, zero gravity toilet. But in the film as a whole, I think he's drawing your attention to like the amazingness and the majesty of what's going on. But also there's, I don't know if you could call it an irony because for the characters, their attitude towards it is very prosaic. Mm -hmm. So when the scientists are, you know, what sticks out most for me is that when the scientists are in the shuttle on the way to the monolith on the moon, they are looking at these photos of the site and discussing the fact that this is this unprecedented discovery. And it was, you know, I forget what the phrase is. Deliberately but it was, you know, buried. Deliberately buried. And they're eating these little sandwiches and making these little, you know, quips. Right. And their interest is peaked clearly, but it's there's no sense of gravitas mm-hmm. at all. Yeah. And I, I'm kind of rambling here, but I guess I'm interested in the question of why the movie is so slow and to what extent it's obviously has takes on a contemplative function, but does it ever descend into being procedural? Just kind of like we're seeing how these things are done. Right. Yeah. Well, so I kind of think that the durational sequences, I think you could characterize them as procedural. I think it actually lends to their believability it, like it gives mm-hmm. me as a viewer the impression of reality because i'm seeing these sequences unfold you know kind of in real time as they would so this happens in a number of instances most obviously during the sort of space docking sequences so at the yeah. beginning there's the pan american a spaceship that's landing into the station but you know Later, when Bowman is rescuing or trying to rescue the body of Dr. Frank, 
Thanks for knowing the names of these characters, by the way. Well, I hope I'm getting them right. You know, it I'm, sounds I'm, right. I think Frank, his last name is Poole. Yeah, right, right. Dr. Frank Poole and David Bowman. But yeah, so when he's trying to recover the body of Frank, you know, that's kind of this slow sequence that, you know, it's funny. It reminds me of those claws that reach down and grab the teddy bears, you know, right. and those like coin operated yeah, yeah. machines. It's like we're in this totally advanced technological future. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, for some reason, right. these arms right. like can't function any more precisely than like I digress. My point is that it also happens in other instances. So Dr. Floyd, the, the, the first doctor that we're introduced to, when he calls his daughter on the phone, that's like a really kind of unremarkable conversation. But we see mm -hmm. it in its from beginning to end. And we see this child interacting with this advanced technology, you know, this extremely this, cute child. Yeah, super cute, but behaving the way you would expect a child to kind of, you yeah. know, umming and eyeing and not really like, you know, staying focused. Like it's it's kind of a weird rambling sequence. Right. But that's so much like a lot of these sequences. Oh, my gosh. When the ape man discovers the use of a bone, you know, mm -hmm. as a as a blunt instrument, you know, that's also kind of it unfolds slowly and we see these things happen in real time. So anyway, it gives for me like a sense of, of reality or of documentary. And it makes, I think, everything that unfolds all the more believable. But then I think, you know, it gives me space for like entering into a contemplative consideration of the beauty of the image that I'm seeing. So, you know, this is like, it's a gorgeous film. And yeah, if absolutely. there's one thing that can be said about it, it's that. And like with any visual form, visually arresting film benefits from being considered or contemplated. And so I think that, you know, these sequences are giving us the time and the opportunity to do that. I, you know, just talking about the film's visual beauty also, it really, with only a couple exceptions towards the end, in my opinion, does not look dated at all. No. In terms of the effects, the practical effects. Yeah, I think it holds amazing. up really well. Yeah. It, it looks beautiful. And, you know, it's easy to forget that this is before we actually went to the moon. Right. You know, but it's right. totally convincing. It seems like it would have been made, you know, a couple of years after that almost. Totally. But yeah, it, it looks absolutely fantastic. Certainly all the exterior shots in space look perfect to me. Yeah. And in terms of effects and everything else. So, you know, I, I think that visually it holds up really well, but I also think the sound design in this oh, yeah. film is incredible. So... We can talk about the music, but I I'm specifically thinking of the beeps and the like alarms that are triggered and the sort of mechanical sounds yeah. in the world, the breathing or the hissing of the oxygen. These sounds are leveraged to tremendously good effect in the film. And I think, you know, coupled with the musical score, just make this a gripping event from beginning to end. I was watching a documentary about the film and somebody commented that it's almost as though Kubrick is is kind of only allowing there to be one sound at a time mm. in this film. That's right. So it really focuses your attention on whatever sound mm -hmm. is happening. It's a very focused film, you know? So if the sound design can be said to be focused, I think you can say the same of the cinematography. You know, that oftentimes we're focused on an image or focused in a particular perspective that kind of is like Kubrick working with a laser pointer. And it's true even of, this, of the moments of silence, you know, like silence itself is used to tremendous effect. I'm thinking particularly of the moment when Frank is sort of cut loose by Hal. And all of a sudden we lose right, the right. sound of the breathing and we just see the body spinning in the void, you know, and it's like, like your stomach just drops out 
from underneath you. It's it's so right that yeah that absence. One cool thing about it, I think, is how perfectly the aesthetic concerns and the concerns of realism coincide because, and this is true, I was thinking both in terms of sound because it's silent in space. It's not like in Star Wars, you know, where you have explosion sounds in space and things like that. Yeah. And also in the slowness of the, not just the the length of the takes, but the slowness of the movement Mm -hmm. of the things you're seeing within those takes, Mm -hmm. not only the vehicles and the ships, but also the people who are walking around inside the ships are often moving very slowly as much for reasons of realism and dealing with issues of gravity and things like that as it is for aesthetic reasons, but it coincides perfectly with that slow pacing. Right, right. Yeah. I have just marvel at the sequences, you know, with the ships kind of dancing this strange ballet in space, especially that first space sequence that we see after the bone is thrown into the air and then it- Right, with the blue Danube waltz. Yeah, right. And it's so foreign, you know, especially in 1968, it's like all of this is pretty much exists only in, in the imagination of a people. And still today, it's totally- well, alien, <laughs> no pun intended, but it has a kind of logic, you know, it has, it's rooted in a realism that I think makes it interesting. So it's not just, you know, pretty or, you know, ornamental. These things have functions and they have an inner logic that even if it's masked to us, the viewer, or even if it's not totally understood by us, it's still felt. You know, that there's an intelligibility. Sure. And I, I think that actually that's a theme that runs through the film, this idea of order in the cosmos, a cosmic order or intelligibility or alignment. Alignment is like, I think, a big recurring thematic motif throughout the film. I mean, obviously, in that opening shot with the planets in alignment that recurs, but also, you know, just lining up a ship with a space station for a docking procedure. I think that that intentionality, focus, ordering of things, this is something that the film asks us to think about. I'd like to talk about, at least briefly, another technical element or a specific moment in the film, which is very famous. Okay. Which is the cut that you mentioned from... The bone flying yeah. up and down into the air to what is – it's not made explicit in the film, but it's supposed to be a military satellite. Like mm. a, I think like it's a nuclear military satellite. So it's one weapon to another. And that I just wanted to mention because it's kind of a nice like moment to – it's really cool, first of all, but it's it's also a nice moment to teach about a technical term. So this is called a match cut. And if you Google match cut, this is the first image that comes up. Oh, cool. And if you read a film textbook, this is the quintessential example of a match cut. So a match cut is an editing technique where you cut from one shot to another where the composition is matched, either in terms of the action that's happening or the subject matter. And most of the time, it's used in a much more quotidian sort of functional way. So you could have like a cut from a long shot of two characters talking to a close shot of one of the characters' faces. That Mm -hmm. would be a match cut. And, you know, these are things we see all the time. But it can also be used in more sort of like stylistically interesting ways. And so this would be an example. This is a very, very famous example of a match cut. And also you can have match cuts in sound too. So you, I'm sure you've seen films where somebody is saying something and then you cut to another character who's, who's – it's like the cut is hinging on a word right, right. and you hear the character finishing a different sentence beginning with that word or something mm-hmm. like that mm-hmm. or, or a sound effect or something like that. And, and then there's all sorts of match cuts that are not necessarily thematic but are just used as nice stylistic transitions. So you could have like somebody – steam from ironing their clothes and then it cuts to like the steam from a locomotive engine or something like that. Right. So I just wanted to mention that because it's kind of a nice a nice way to learn about some of these technical aspects of 
filmmaking. Yeah, well, I'm certainly grateful to learn about them because actually that might help us discuss the scene that I was kind of hoping to look at together for our listeners. You know, you'll remember that we are going to try with each of these episodes to select a scene, you know, maybe just a couple minutes to look at a little more closely. And Mm -hmm. I wanted to propose that we look at the first couple of minutes right after the second title card that we see, Jupiter Mission, 18 months later. Because I don't know if you could call it exactly a match cut, but there are some interesting cuts that happen in those first couple minutes. So the first shot is of the ship, you know, the really long ship with the bulbous end on one end and the jets on the other. And so we see that and then cut inside to a shot of Dr. Frank Poole running in the sort of main living chamber. It's totally marvelous to see because he's defying gravity running along the outside of this circular room. So we see it from a fixed perspective first, but we're the camera is in a fixed position watching him as he runs around. But then it cuts to his perspective or rather, you know, the camera's right behind him as he's running. So now the world is moving, but he is in place. And I think that I'm that's... I'm going to link to this. I'm going to link to the YouTube video that you sent me of this great two-minute scene for so people can actually watch that. Great. Yeah. And, and I think that that's already a cool move because Kubrick sort of identifies this relativity to sort of what's going on in the world, how it can be seen so differently from different perspectives. In the first cut, we see him moving in a stationary space. But then in the next cut, we see the space moving and he is stationary. Mm. But that's not even really the cut that excites me the most about this sequence. It's the following. And that's what made me think of when you were explaining what a match cut is, Thomas, because after we see Dr. Frank Poole from a fixed perspective, then it cuts to our first image of Hal. But we see him in a way that we don't see him in the rest of the film. Mm. We see him spinning. So in this time, we are in a fixed perspective and we see Hal moving, whereas every other time we see Hal in the film, we see him as if he's fixed and not moving. So I think it's remarkable that he's spinning. But then also what's really cool is that for the first time we see Dr. Bowman and Bowman is, we don't see him directly. We see his reflection in the lens of Hal. And it's almost as if, well, you know, it it rhymes or it matches the image of Dr. Poole running in his sort of little hamster cage wheel. We see Dr. Bowman, if only in a reflection, kind of inside this little hamster cage wheel that is Hal's lens. So when I noticed that, I thought, wow, that's cool. And I think that we could talk about maybe, you know, what Kubrick might be gesturing toward with all of that, other than, you know, just it's exciting to look at, which it is also. So that's not to be dismissed. But I don't know, Thomas, do you have any thoughts looking at this? Like what might be going on? I mean, this is just totally going off what you said. So Hal is, first of all, just in a literal sense or like a sort of literal metaphorical sense, Hal is. I think they say that Hal is essentially the brain and the central nervous system of the Mm -hmm. ship, which means that the ship is Hal's body in a sense. So they're kind of inside that that shot. It's almost like he's inside Hal. Right. And there's there's a sense in which that's true insofar Hal is the consciousness of the ship. You know, I, I don't know, just sort of like spitballing, you could say being trapped by technology. <laughs> yeah, well, I no, know. I think I think it really does right off the bat sort of introduce questions of you know, this tension like the question of how to live humanly within the horizon of increasingly advanced technology. So, it's obvious that the ship is not designed for 
you know, Frank to be able to thrive as a human. So he has to, he has to find, there are technological solutions. So we see him sunbathing, for instance, or at least that's what it appears like to me that he's like tanning or just getting maybe some vitamin D or something from some sort of like sun bath. Right. It's an artificial light that he's under. But then also here, you know, he's exercising. But I think there's also, you know, I think it evokes the imagery of a hamster cage, of a treadmill, of kind of moving but not getting anywhere. I think it it sort of... Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, it kind of proposes the question of progress, you know, and what, what does that mean? And can we progress so much that we sort of progress ourselves into our own little, you know, prison? But I think also it, I think, makes a first gesture toward Hal's finitude or his sort of the possibility of his having a mistaken perspective. Mm. So so Hal is introduced to us when he is introduced to us as After this, this yeah. yeah, as this supercomputer, incapable of error, basically, is the way he's pitched. Perfect operational processing, whatever. But when we see him this first time, he is spinning. And we associate spinning with, oh, my head is spinning, you know, like like disorientation or confusion or mm-hmm. not having a fixed point of reference. And, you know, I think it is worth pointing out that this is the only time we see him like this. Everywhere else, he's sort of this fixed perspective, almost monolithic, you know, kind of like the monolith that we see right. throughout the film. But here he's not. And since it's just been preceded by two cuts showing us the same action from different perspectives and how differently that can appear, I Mm. think it almost plays out like a visual syllogism. Like, well, therefore, this perspective too can be flawed. And that's all contained within, you know, one minute, really, without any words and just conveyed cinematographically, (laughs) cinematically. Yeah, that's... That's cool, man. I will tell you how my gut rea- what my gut reaction to that first shot of Hal is. And of course, we don't know what Hal is or that it's Hal. And we you know the first time we see that movie. But, you know, my first impression of that was just the sort of like idea of surveillance. Yeah. They're being constantly watched. Right. I think so. That also works on that gut level. Yeah, sure. well, I, I think that this film is ahead of its time in a lot of respects, and, and in that in particular, you know, privacy concerns. These guys are living in a technological context where their every movement, their every word is watched. And it's not just watched, yeah. but it's analyzed, and it's able right, to be sort right. of computed through algorithms and understood in a sense. And increasingly, that's kind of the landscape that we're finding ourselves in. So I think that 2001 has some things to say about this technological future that we're carving out for ourselves where, you know, we're basically under nonstop surveillance from our, you know, robotic creations. There's an interesting line when they're talking with Mission Control and Mission Control tells them that there this is after hal has like predicted the failure of one of the parts and dr bowman has gone out fetched the part they've looked at it and found that there's nothing wrong with it mission control says we're being advised that your hal computer was in error predicting the fault and then he says we're running cross check routines to determine the reliability of this conclusion and that he says that we came to this conclusion via a twin HAL 9000 computer. So it's like to say that the HAL computer was in error, he points to the conclusion of another HAL computer to back it up. And it's kind of like the faulty logic of that, I think is is the kind of absurdity of that is funny because it's like, well, we're, yeah, we're running cross-check routines to determine the reliability of this conclusion, but what's running those cross-check routines? It's just the HAL computer, you know, just another (laughs) HAL computer. So it's like increasingly we are forfeiting our human, like our prerogative to cross check technology. And and, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I'm looking at this scene of HAL, this first shot. I don't know if it is HAL spinning. I think it might be the thing that, which character is it? Oh, 
It's Bowman. It's Bowman. I think the thing that he's in is spinning. Oh, because I'm looking at the cool. outer edges and they aren't spinning. Oh. I think he's no, in some kind great, of spinning thing at the center great, of the ship. That's totally a great point. Yeah, because, so we because are actually, even where you sent me a video which is using this scene to explain centripetal motion, and over that scene, the text "weightless at the hub" appears. So I think that uh, that's the hub, and the hub of this centrifuge or whatever you want to call it is is spinning. That's a but great it still point. has this sort of disorienting effect, you know, and you mm-hmm. can debate whether it's, you know, Hal is is spinning or Hal is sort of like looking at the human from every angle and you know, analyzing yeah, yeah. it every which way or, or what. Yeah. Well, you know, that's that's great that I, I didn't even notice that. But you're right. Hal is stationary in this, but it almost makes it even more delightful that it can kind of be seen on all of these different levels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I also really like the music in this scene that recurs in a couple of places, I think. And I, I just Googled to find out what it was because it wasn't a piece that I recognized. It is the Adagio Movement Carpet Weavers from Aram Kachaturian's Gayan Ballet mm. Suite Number no. 3. Kachaturian mm-hmm. was, I believe, an Armenian composer. I really liked this music. I, I found it very evocative of a certain kind of melancholy, but not like a kind of a passionate melancholy, more like kind of like a sense of being in a kind of waste, being kind yeah. of like listless. Mm. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. And I mean, that's that's very much kind of what we're seeing too. So a kind of like a melancholy that would strike you from being in a routine in a sterile environment and not having a sort of direction. Now, they do have a direction ultimately, but... I'm sure that from day to day in such a place, it can almost feel like you're you're not moving anywhere. Sure. So I just really liked that musical choice mm-hmm. for that particular scene. And I think that I think most of the other musical pieces function maybe more thematically than that one does. Sure. Because that one feels more like it just is more an emotional resonance. Yeah. It's like more descriptive. Right. Like emotionally descriptive. Yeah, the more we look at this scene, the more I really love it. I mean, it's the first scene of this next act, and it's the first time we're seeing these characters who really kind of become the dominant characters in this film. And I just think it's such a cool way to sort of get us into this this world here on, on this ship. You think of all the different ways that Kubrick could have begun this segment, to begin it this way is really remarkable. So Hal is a great character. I mean, the voice is everything, right? For yeah. Hal and and, yeah. and and the voice is perfect and it's clearly influenced, you know, our series and, you know, things like that as time has gone on. But it has this tone of complete quiet confidence. Yeah. I don't know how you'd describe it, but just like everything's completely under control. <laughs> it's kind of a reflective tone, but I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's no, just you're, a, it's, you're totally it's a right. Voice. You're totally right. It's it's perfect, you know, because it's it's haunting yet reassuring at the same time. Right. You know, like it can yeah. be comforting and terrifying. And also, you know, it, it has like this artificial quality that goes beyond, you know, like like a staid robotic voice. Right. It's artificial, even in its seeming to be human, in the obvious effort that has been put into programming this thing to sound human, right. that sounds artificial, you know? And and so it's like, it is yeah. a great voice. You, you wonder- I, And it has a how, certain charm to it. I mean, when he, you, you see the rapport that he has with the crew right. at the beginning, and it's almost likable. Yeah. Okay. So maybe this is a good time to just talk about how 2001 handles this theme of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a popular theme nowadays and one at which I roll my eyes most of the time because I'm just totally uninterested in the metaphysically impossible. (laughs) Like I'm down with fantasy. I'm down with sci-fi, but I want it to unfold within the sort of metaphysically possible because otherwise it doesn't have anything to tell me about reality 
Right. And I think that that's what makes sci-fi and fantasy interesting is that yeah. they they have something to tell us. Let's just specify what we're talking about is the idea of artificial intelligence as being you know something equal to or surpassing human intelligence not you know whatever problems could arise as a result of what we now call artificial intelligence you know as we have it today for example there's all sorts of interesting things you could talk about with artificial intelligence on a historical level on the level of you know what you were saying before about humans giving up their their prerogative of making judgments and things like that but we're specifically talking about the the idea of artificial intelligence as an actual intelligence. Right. You know, as as an emergent like free will and right, feeling exactly. and right. self-awareness, these are all just dumb questions because they're impossible. Right. And I don't care how sort of, you know, fancy your artificial intelligence gets. I don't care how fabricated or how like ornamented and intricate you're able to make it. It's still an elaborate mimicry. And, and there's That's a non- interesting. When don't they say that at the beginning, they make a point of the word that they use to describe? Right. I was just about to say there's a nod to that in the sort of BBC World Tonight interview where he says something about the how supercomputer is able to reproduce some would say mimic human intelligence. So it's like yeah. yeah, this distinction between reproducing or mimicking human intelligence. Right. And I, you know, whereas I totally roll my eyes at movies that sort of depend upon the idea that that this could actually happen i'll mention the most recent season of black mirror like a garbage season from what i could tell just by watching the first episode with miley cyrus in it it's handled more interestingly in 2001 because i think that everything that hal does it never requires me to believe that hal has developed free will or intelligence or you know self-awareness or consciousness maybe i'm not correct in thinking this if i some if I people have argued out. that hal goes insane because he is ordered to deceive the crew mm. or withhold information for them and and this introduces some kind of conflict into its programming or something like sure. that there's a debate over what exactly is the behind hal's actions in the film right and i i don't pretend to know exactly why hal you know deteriorates the way that he does but i don't feel the need to explain it with this sort of like deus ex machina like emergent intelligence i totally see there still being space for you know arguing about like what is it specifically that causes him to kind of malfunction in this way but i find the malfunctioning totally believable and all the more sinister for it you know because i don't find you know stories about robots or ai very sinister or terrifying if in order for them to become you know oppressive they first have to develop intelligence it's like okay well that's never going to happen so i don't need to worry about that but if it can become oppressive, become inhuman and murderous even without having to sort of develop its own intelligence, if it can still be operating, you know, as a machine, as an artificial intelligence, but one that suddenly turns on its maker, like then that is really sinister and terrifying. And I think that that's what's going on here. I mean, I guess the one thing that I I will point to that maybe speaks, you know, against this is well it's the interviewer actually in that bbc segment mentions it as well when he says i detected a hint of pride in his response to me about his perfection and 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 accuracy it's true you know like we heard his response there and we can see that yeah there's kind of like a hint of pride there but then dr bowman says well you know he's programmed to seem to have emotions because it makes it easier for us to talk with him well that kind of plays out again later, I think, in this really excellent way when Dr. Bowman is returning to the ship after trying to rescue Dr. Frank Poole. And, you know, he says, open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. And there's no response. And then he says it again, open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. And he says it a few more times. And he says, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? No response until finally... Hal says, 
affirmative, Dave. I read you. And it's like, whoa, like, why did he not respond for that long only to respond if not for pride? Do you know what I mean, Thomas? Like, why would he respond if not because of pride? Because, well, yeah, because a computer doesn't really, I wouldn't think a computer responds to badgering per se. Right. You totally. know what I mean? Totally. He, it would he do it completely him. rationally. It wouldn't waste he, time on, right, you know. Right, because then, cause then he, he talks to him, you know, he says, you know, basically like Dr. Bowman says something like, what's the problem? And Hal is like, well, I think you and I both know the answer to that. And I read your lips. And he, he has this sort of self-indulgent moment of like the evil genius, like revealing his plan, you know, it's like open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. I'm afraid I can't do that, Dave, you know, and it's like. He ends that conversation by saying something like, this conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. And it's like, well, what purpose did that conversation serve if Mm -hmm. not to stroke your ego? But then it's contrasted by Dr. Bowman's silence when he decides what to do. You know, he says like, okay, fine. I'm going to go through the emergency airlock. Hal, you know, says you're going to find that hard to do without your helmet. But then basically Dave stops talking to him. And he gets silent and he just does what he needs to do. And even when he gets onto the ship and now Hal is kind of badgering him, you know, what, what do you think you're doing? You know, I'm feeling better now. Like, don't do that. Stop. Dr. Bowman says nothing. And Hal even says, I can see that you're very upset about this, but it's obvious actually that he's not, you know, he's totally calm. I don't know. You know, I think that there is a sense that, I don't know if it's fear that Hal might do something more to him before he can disable him, but there is at least when once he starts disconnecting Hal, he's breathing faster. And the way that when Hal offers to sing the song, he sort of says, yes, do that in a kind of almost a cons- consoling way. He seems to be, you know, have some discomfort with that he's actually killing Hal. Hmm. You know, whether or not he thinks he thinks rationally that this is actually like a person, Hmm. he seems to be, I don't know, I get a sense. Why do you think he says, yeah, let's hear that song? It it, it almost seems like, you know, like he's trying to give Hal some occupation, you know, some consolation as he dies or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I don't know. I think that that's probably as good an explanation as any. So what do you think, what's the role of this Hal subplot in the larger themes of the film? Hmm. Obviously, like human evolution, there's like two possible directions for it, right? One being artificial intelligence and the other being whatever the heck happens at the end. Well, I think that this film really is like a triumph of the human spirit. I think that's what we're, we're seeing, you know opaqueness of the ending notwithstanding you know i think it it begins with the dawn of man and then you know it's it's very much a human centric film and then we see i think in this sort of confrontation between hal and dr bowman the triumph of sort of human intuition and ingenuity and manual override (laughs) over robots you know i i think i found myself right. thinking like see this is why it's so important to have manual overrides like just as a matter of principle uh-huh. I, I get i really bristle at the seat belt beeping indicators that tell you when you, when your seat belt's off in a car you know not that i think that seat belts are a bad thing i totally think they're great i think everybody should wear seat belts but i think that at the end <laughs> of the day you. i should choose to wear a seatbelt or not and not be badgered into it by my car like my thing that i own so fine yeah maybe beep to remind me that i I don't have my seatbelt on but once you've reminded me you've served your purpose i don't need you to keep beeping at me like and and so so a lot of cars you can't even override this you can't you can't get it to shut up it just the only way to get it to shut up is to to comply and to put on your seatbelt. And I think that just as a matter of principle... Are you angry with me, James? Thomas, as a matter detect, of principle... Do I detect some anger in your voice, James? I hope I it, haven't done anything to upset you. It just needs to be rejected out of hand, you know? I'm we just need... being... I'm trying to talk to you like I'm your car. Yeah, well, 
thanks be to God, my car does shut up after a, you know, it's like I've counted it. It's like after like 182 beeps or something, it finally stops. And you better believe that sometimes I just defy it out of spite. But yeah, you know, I found myself thinking in this film like, okay, yes, thank God that there are actually ways for David Bowman to accomplish things manually without depending on Hal, because if he had to depend on Hal for these things, it would be bad. It would be very Just bad. one more thing about that scene is interesting that I read somebody's comment on this online that the little modules that Dave is pulling out to kill Hal almost are like little mini monoliths. Oh. So it's interesting because like the film, you know, involves these aliens or whatever prompting these stages in the development of human intelligence. And then you see that like sub version of that with man creating artificial intelligence, but it clearly doesn't work out in the same way. Right. And I think I agree with you on the treatment of AI in this film, because even though I generally think AI is dumb in itself, that wasn't what I thought was dumb about the film. When I was reading about this film before I saw it, I saw that the initial critical reaction to 2001 was kind of mixed, and a lot of people thought it was nonsense until people started going to see it and dropping acid in the theater, (laughs) and that's when it started to take off. But I mean, that might be an exaggeration, but especially, apparently a lot of New York-based critics did not like the film. And Kubrick commented, perhaps there is a certain element of the lumpen literati that is so dogmatically atheist and materialist and earthbound that it finds the grandeur of space and the myriad mysteries of cosmic intelligence anathema. So, you know, I was wondering, you know, well, okay, before I saw the film, what does he mean atheist? Why would that be the reason that they didn't like this film? I want to read another quote from the same interview with Kubrick, where he talks about the theme of the film. If the quote seems long, that's just so that you will be provoked into recognizing the stupidity of it. (laughs) I will say that the God concept is at the heart of 2001, but not any traditional anthropomorphic image of God. I don't believe in any of Earth's monotheistic religions, but I do believe that one can construct an intriguing scientific definition of God once you accept the fact that there are approximately 100 billion stars in our galaxy alone, that each star is a life-giving sun, and that there are approximately 100 billion galaxies in just the visible universe. Given a planet in a stable orbit, not too hot and not too cold, and given a few billion years of chance chemical reactions created by the interaction of a sun's energy on the planet's chemicals, it's fairly certain that life in one form or another will eventually emerge. It's reasonable to assume that there must be, in fact, countless billions of such planets where biological life has arisen and the odds of some proportion of such life developing intelligence are high. Now, the sun is by no means an old star, and its planets are mere children in cosmic age, so it seems likely that there are billions of planets in the universe not only where intelligent life is on a lower scale than man, but other billions where it is approximately equal, and others still where it is hundreds of thousands of millions of years in advance of us. When you think of the giant technological strides that man has made in a few millennia, less than a microsecond in the chronology of the universe, can you imagine the evolutionary development that much older life forms have taken? They may have progressed from biological species, which are fragile shells for the mind at best, into immortal machine entities. And then over innumerable eons, they could emerge from the chrysalis of matter transformed into beings of pure energy and spirit. Their potentialities would be limitless and their intelligence ungraspable by humans. So this is Kubrick's understanding of why people atheists would reject his movie (laughs) (laughs) okay thomas well point well taken that was dumb but you know to his credit he doesn't say any of this in the film and it's not even you know a necessary conclusion that one walks away with watching the film you know it's hearing that quote you can see how it is illustrated in some of the film's gestures and images. Answer this question. Give me a straight answer. Do you think God put the monolith there, James? Thomas, I think that the monolith is a symbol. It functions symbolically even in the world of the film. You know, it has no direct effect except for the one instance where it it sends a transmission from the moon pointed to, to Jupiter. But even that transmission you know 
there's nothing to indicate that that's actually functioning in any specific way, you know, it like turns sending the a message into or doing. People. Okay, but how does it do that? Through symbol, through, you know, what it sort of represents. It, the monolith represents order and proportion. So it, it, it affects what it represents. It's almost sacramental. I mean, Ugh. like it's, it's dude, it's smoothness and uniformity and it's monochromatic. Like I think, okay. It's almost I like a demonic that, uniformity. No, 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 no. So it's like, okay. So Kubrick said it in that first quote, you said the myriad mysteries of cosmic intelligence. I think that the film is interested in the intelligence of the cosmos, which if you remember your St. Thomas Aquinas, is one of the proofs of God, the proof from intelligibility that, if I'm remembering correctly, it's basically that we find intelligence in the cosmos and that intelligence requires a cause from a higher intelligence, therefore God, you know, or, or the, I, I forget what, it's like the unmoved mover, but it's like the unintellected intellect or something. I don't know. That explains why at the end of the film, gosh, what's the character's name again? Bowman, David Bowman. David Bowman is put into a zoo constructed by aliens, and you can hear them gibbering from the outside of the zoo as you watch it. Okay, him. all right. Well, see, I think that that's too explicit of a reading of the ending, which, you know, I think you can read it that way. And it's obviously, so there was a novelization of the film, and a lot of people will point to the novelization as like where you need to go to get your answers because a lot of things that are kind of left murky in the film are made more explicit in the novel. But it's important that Kubrick does leave them murky. So, mm. you know, so your reading of that ending is a valid reading, but it's not the only reading that you can walk away with. The point that I'm getting at is that the space you baby know, is dumb. Okay, so it might have to do with aliens in this movie, but the aliens can be a proxy, a sci-fi proxy for considering like the divinity of intelligibility in the cosmos. So the way I had this explained to me when I was learning about the proof of God via intelligibility was that it's like you're walking in the woods and you're hundreds of miles away from any civilization, you know, maybe you like crash landed or something. And you come across an empty Coke can, a discarded Coke can. Well, you would you would find that can and you would be very heartened. You know, you would you would take courage because you would see it as a sign of civilization, of intelligence. You wouldn't go, well, OK, this Coke can just sort of spontaneously appeared here. You would take it as a very definite indication of an intelligence that begot it. And if you touch it, it makes you smarter. Thomas, so in the same way, in the same way, when we find, you know, intelligence in the cosmos, we find an intelligible order to this cosmic reality, and it should encourage us and hearten us, it points us to the divine intelligence. And this is what the church teaches with respect to, to evolution as well. You know, that like, that Catholics are free to believe in a kind of, you know, biological evolution, but it's an evolution that still requires an impetus from without. It requires God. God creates the soul directly. And so I see that kind of symbolized in this Dawn of Man segment where you have biological evolution taking its course, but it's also coupled with the sort of direct provocation of a higher intelligence, which, you know, in the world of 2001 Space Odyssey is understood as an alien intelligence, like an alien life form. But at the end of the day, I mean, this is what I think makes sci-fi compelling. You know, it's what makes stories about aliens interesting or conspiracy theories interesting is that they mirror or echo the real cosmic fact, you know, the, the cosmic reality. Like Catholics don't need conspiracy theories to see that evil is organized. You know, and that there is like a, a master intelligence that's sort of out to bring down humanity and that that intelligence can orchestrate a lot of seemingly disparate things to humanity's detriment. You know, we don't need conspiracy theories to explain that because we know that Satan exists in the same way that we don't need aliens to explain evolution or how 
you know, intelligence in the world can be, we can still be compelled by these stories and use them as a start, like a jumping off point to consider the actual cosmic reality that we find ourselves in, which is God's reality. I think you're a very kind man. <laughs> what do you think of the last, I mean, the last half hour of the movie, I definitely find myself squirming in my seat as I watch it. And also I, it's some of the, there's some parts that do feel a little dated to me. I, I would say mainly the alien landscapes part and the aging on Bowman. But the zoo or whatever, the neoclassical room that he finds himself in is incredibly creepy to me. Even like aside from like the sound effects and, and stuff, it's there's something profoundly unnerving. Yeah. And like hellish about it. Yeah, totally. Because it's supposed to be something like familiar and human, but it feels totally wrong. Right. And like, I mean, probably mainly because, because of the floor, it feels like right. really cold and like, yeah, like it feels like a lab that you're going to be experimented on in. Yeah. The art and the, the furniture is, yeah, definitely unsettling. And, you know, it makes me think of Kubrick, you know, as a horror director. There's a lot of sort of horror mm -hmm. things going on in 2001. Like the close up when Hal is murdering the zoom. You know what I'm talking about? Like yep. the zoom in three stages on Hal's eye. Yeah. The final sequence, the final half hour of the film is maybe the least interesting. It's certainly the most confounding. And even perhaps one could say the least visually interesting, although that's, you know, of course, debatable. And I tend to to find myself enjoying watching it as well, as long as I'm not sort of thinking about it in too explicit or too literal of terms. So, so for instance, you know, when I see those landscapes, I'm not thinking about them as depictions of alien landscapes or other worlds. I'm kind of taking it symbolically to sure. represent, you know, it's like the suggestion of something totally foreign, totally Yeah, I'm fine with that. Different. I mean, I connected it more to the creation of the earth because of those cosmic gases. You know, some people have suggested that he's seeing the Big Bang at a certain point in there. Mm -hmm. So so I mm -hmm. actually connected, I said alien because you mentioned that, but, you know, when I saw it, I connected it more to the landscapes as you also connected it at the beginning of the film. I just didn't like how they looked very much, I, I guess sure. I'll say. Sure, sure. Yeah, you know, I think that the way I view that ending is is I, I view it as, as Bowman's confrontation with death. And it's a confrontation that has been sort of, you know, catalyzed by this alien monolith. But it also changes him into a star baby. Right. Well, so I think that, you know, the end of the movie leaves me with you know, questions about what the actual final frontier is. So, you know, we're, we're explorers. Humans are. I mean, all of our history has been going out and discovering. The, the ship that they're on is called Discovery. And the real final frontier, like the real destination for this impulse, this explorer impulse, is the afterlife, is our eternal destiny. And I think that you know, my reading of the film at the end there is that this alien monolith has, you know, catalyzed or precipitated or provoked this encounter with death, this confrontation with the final thing, whether that's through some sort of time travel. I think that you can read that final room that he's in as if this is his like We've just been transported, you know, like 50 years to his deathbed, and this is the home that he's living in in the future. You know, that's that's a reading that's not supported by the novel, sure. but forget the novel. I'm talking about the movie, you know, so because we move through these stages of his aging. First, we see him in the suit and he looks kind of old, but then we see him in the robe and he's looking even older. And then we see him on the bed and he's very old. And then he sees the monolith again, and it's it's this portal, you know, it's death. It's the, the angel of death is there to meet him. 
and passing through that, what are we presented with? Well, okay, famously, the star child, which, right. you know, again, if you're going to turn to the novel for your explanation of what this star child is, then you're just forced to just sure. despair of which the I ha- dumbness. Which I, haven't. I will say, like, I like, you know, based, you were talking about the final frontier. I like, you know, in that light, I like that it ends with a return to Earth. Yeah, the new in, Earth, in the sense that know? it's you returned in a new state rather than you're just going progressively out to further and further frontiers forever for totally. no particular reason. But on the other hand, I'm really sad that the film ends with the completely uninspiring and stupid looking image of the Star yeah. Trial. <laughs> It's, it's, it bums me out that it ends on that. And when I said the film is dumb, you know, like I'm really talking about I'm saying that in, in part to be provocative. But I but I really mean I only say that because of the last half hour of the film, because I, you know, I could, you know, see and disagree with, you know, some of the things that maybe the film says about evolution in the beginning, you know, such as how the first intelligent act that, you know, man commits is, is murder, for example, or that's like the sign of his emerging intelligence. But it's only the last half hour that I just find like mm-hmm. kind of like where where it ventures into like kind of like pseudo intellectual like stoner territory. Yeah, yeah, and I'll admit, you know, that I'm doing a lot of gymnastics to try to reclaim that <laughs> last half say. hour. <laughs> it's only because I've watched the darn movie so many times and have had to sort of deal with this last half hour and what right. do I think of it? And I think that there is a way for a thoughtful conversation to come out of those last moments. But yeah, you know, I think that it sort of flies in the face perhaps of what the original intention is. But then, you know, I would just say again, it's to Kubrick's credit that he leaves it Mm -hmm. more obscure and he doesn't tighten it down too hard. You know, maybe he saw that what he was working with had this sort of symbolic efficacy that if he yeah. just left it a little more confusing, you know, it might have a little more depth to it. Well, so I think that this film is included on the Vatican film list, you know, obviously because it's, you know, a beautiful film visually. It's in the art category, so it's definitely a pioneering film in the world of special effects. I, I found myself thinking, like, wow, I can't believe that this film was made, you know, only like like 80 years or something after the dawn of film, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So there's that. But I think also because it has this kind of potency, you know, if if also an imperfect one, but it is concerned about the cosmos and the intelligence that we find in it and man's sure. place in it. And it might not come to super satisfying conclusions, but I think it's still got some heft to it and there's something to sink your teeth into. Yeah. And there's clearly a lot of great subtext and thematic density to the film. There's a lot of interesting stuff to discuss. So you would never say that it's a shallow film, even if you were to say that the ultimate conclusion about aliens or whatever is kind of shallow and doesn't have much to it. Like the texture of the film as a whole is pretty rich. Mm -hmm. It's also very prescient in various ways with technology, even with just like the video calling and little things like that. You know, Kubrick asked Lloyd's of London if they could insure him in case NASA spoiled the plot of the film by discovering extraterrestrial life before the movie came out. What? And Kubrick is famously kind of a control freak, so it's kind of funny. Ridiculous. Okay. Well, James, I enjoyed this, but I think I'll enjoy the next one more. I liked 2001. I enjoyed watching it, but all the same, I'm glad this is over and <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking forward to the next film that we, we talk about. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to getting a guest on this show so I can talk with someone else other than you about it. Whoa. I brought you into the podcast world, man, and I can take you out of it. I also edit this podcast, which means I can add in comebacks later that I didn't think of at the time.
All right, everyone, the next film we'll be discussing will be maybe our first real Hollywood production, John Ford's beloved 1939 Western Stagecoach, starring John Wayne. And it'll be our first episode with a guest, a very special guest, Anthony Esselin. Finally, please join our special Facebook group and join in the film discussions there. That's at facebook.com slash groups slash Catholic pods. This has been a production of catholicculture.org. Thanks for listening. <laughs>